Story nine of Wounds in the Rain War Stories by Stephen Crane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story nine This Majestic Lie Parts two through four. Two. Johnny strolled carelessly through dark narrow streets. Near every corner were two orden publicos, a kind of soldier police, quiet in the shadow of some doorway, their Remingtons ready, their eyes shining. Johnny walked past as if he owned them, and their eyes followed him with a sort of lazy mechanical suspicion which was militant in none of its moods. Johnny was suffering from a desire to be splendidly imprudent. He wanted to make the situation gasp and thrill and tremble. From time to time he tried to conceive the idea of his being caught, but to save his eyes he could not imagine it. Such an event was impossible to his peculiar breed of fatalism, which could not have conceded death until he had mouldered seven years. He arrived at the Café Aguacate and found it much changed. The thick wooden shutters were up to keep light from shining into the street. Inside there were only a few Spanish officers. Johnny walked to the private rooms at the rear. He found an empty one and pressed the electric button. When he had passed through the main part of the café, no one had noted him. The first to recognize him was the waiter who answered the bell. This worthy man turned to stone before the presence of Johnny. Buenas noches, Francisco, said the spy, enjoying himself. I have hunger. Bring me bread, butter, eggs, and coffee. There was a silence. The waiter did not move. Johnny smiled casually at him. The man's throat moved. Then, like one suddenly re-endowed with life, he bolted from the room. After a long time he returned with the proprietor of the place. In the wicked eye of the latter there gleamed the light of a plan. He did not respond to Johnny's genial greeting, but at once proceeded to develop his position. Johnny, he said, bread is very dear in Havana. It is very dear. Is it? said Johnny, looking keenly at the speaker. He understood at once that here was some sort of an attack upon him. Yes, answered the proprietor of the Café Aguacate, slowly and softly. It is very dear. I think to-night one small bit of bread will cost you one centine in advance. A centine approximates five dollars in gold. The spy's face did not change. He appeared to reflect. And how much for the butter? he asked at last. The proprietor gestured, There is no butter. Do you think we can have everything with those Yankee pigs sitting out there on their ships? And how much for the coffee? asked Johnny musingly. Again the two men surveyed each other during a period of silence. Then the proprietor said gently, I think your coffee will cost you about two centines. And the eggs? Eggs are very dear. I think eggs would cost you about three centines for each one. The new looked at the old. The North Atlantic looked at the Mediterranean. The wooden nutmeg looked at the olive. Johnny slowly took six centines from his pocket and laid them on the table. That's for bread, coffee, and one egg. I don't think I could eat more than one egg tonight. I'm not so hungry as I was. The proprietor held a perpendicular finger and tapped the table with it. Oh, senor, he said politely, I think you would like two eggs. Johnny saw the finger. He understood it. E yes, he drawled, I would like two eggs. He placed three more centines on the table. And uh, a little thing for the waiter? I am sure his services will be excellent, invaluable. Yes, for the waiter. Another centine was laid on the table. The proprietor bowed and preceded the waiter out of the room. There was a mirror on the wall, and springing to his feet, the spy thrust his face close to the honest glass. Well, I'm damned, he ejaculated. Is this me, 
or is this the Honorable D. Hayseed Whiskers of Kansas? Who am I, anyhow? Five dollars in gold. Say, these people are clever. They know their business, they do. Bread, coffee, and two eggs, and not even sure of getting it. Fifty da— Never mind. Wait until the war is over. Fifty dollars gold. He sat for a long time. Nothing happened. Hmm, he said at last, that's the game. As the front door of the café closed upon him, he heard the proprietor and one of the waiters burst into derisive laughter. Martha was waiting for him. And here you are, safe back, she said, with delight as she let him enter. And did you bring the bread? Did you bring the bread? But she saw that he was raging like a lunatic. His face was red and swollen with temper. His eyes shot forth gleams. Presently he stood before her in the patio where the light fell on him. "'Don't speak to me!' he choked out, waving his arms. "'Don't speak to me! Damn your bread! I went to the Café Aguacate. Oh, yes, I went there. Of course I did. And do you know what they did to me? No! Oh! They didn't do anything to me at all. Not a thing! Fifty dollars! Ten gold pieces! May the saints guard us, cried Martha. And what was that for? Because they wanted them more than I did, snarled Johnny. Don't you see the game? I go into the Café Aguacate. The owner of the place says to himself, Hello! Here's that Yankee, what they call Johnny. He's got no right here in Havana. I guess I'll peach on him to the police. They'll put him in cabanas as a spy. Then he does a little more thinking, and finally he says, No, I guess I won't peach on him just this minute. First I'll take a small flyer myself. So in he comes and looks me right in the eye and says, Excuse me, but it will be a centine for the bread, a centine for the coffee, and eggs are at three centines each. Besides, there will be a small matter of another gold piece for the waiter. I think this over. I think it over hard. He's clever, anyhow. When this cruel war is over, I'll be after him. I'm a nice secret agent of the United States government, I am. I am here to be too clever for all the Spanish police, and the first thing I do is get buncoed by a rotten little thimble-rigger in a café. Oh, yes, I'm all right. May the saints guard us, cried Martha again. I'm old enough to be your mother, or maybe your grandmother, and I've seen a lot. But it's many a year since I laid eyes on such a ignorant, wrong-headed little red Indian as ye are. Why didn't ye take my advice and stay here at the house with decency and comfort? But he must be all for doing everything high and mighty. The café aguacate, if you please. No plain food for his highness. He turns up his nose at codfish salad. Thunder and lightning, are you going to ram that thing down my throat every two minutes, are you? And in truth she could see that one more reference to that illustrious beyond would break the back of Johnny's gentle disposition as one breaks a twig on the knee. She shifted with Celtic ease. Did you bring the bread? she asked. He gazed at her for a moment and suddenly laughed. I forgot to mention, he informed her impressively, that they did not take the trouble to give me either the bread, the coffee, or the eggs. The powers! cried Martha. But it's all right. I stopped at a shop. From his pockets he brought a small loaf, some kind of German sausage, and a flask of Jamaica rum. About all I could get, and they didn't want to sell them either. They expect presently they can exchange a box of sardines for a grand piano. We are not blockaded by the Yankee warships. We are blockaded by our grocers, said Martha, quoting the epidemic Havana saying. But she did not delay long from the little loaf. She cut a slice from it and sat eagerly munching. Johnny seemed more interested in the Jamaica rum. He looked up from his second glass, however, because he heard a peculiar sound. The old woman was weeping. Eh, what's this? he demanded in distress, but with the manner of a man who thinks gruffness is the only thing that will make people feel better and cease. 
What's this, anyhow? What are you crying for? It's the bread, sobbed Martha. It's the bread. Huh? What's the matter with it? It's so good, so g g good. The rain of tears did not prevent her from continuing her unusual report. Oh, it's so good. This is the first in weeks. I didn't know bread could be so like heaven. Here, said Johnny seriously, take a little mouthful of this rum. It will do you good. No, I only want the b b b b b bread. Well, take the bread, too. There you are. Now you feel better. By Jove, when I think of that Café Aguacate man, fifty dollars gold, and then not to get anything either. Say, after the war, I'm going there, and I'm just going to raise that place to the ground. You see, I'll make him think he can charge me fifteen dollars for an egg, and then not give me the egg. 3. Johnny's subsequent activity in Havana could truthfully be related in part to a certain temporary price of eggs. It is interesting to note how close that famous event got to his eye, so that, according to the law of perspective, it was as big as the capital of Washington, where centers the spirit of his nation. Around him he felt a similar and ferocious expression of life, which informed him too plainly that if he was caught he was doomed. Neither the garrison nor the citizens of Havana would tolerate any nonsense in regard to him if he was caught. He would have the steel screw against his neck in short order, and what was the main thing to bear him up against the desire to run away before his work was done? A certain temporary price of eggs? It not only hid the capital of Washington, it obscured the dangers in Havana. Something was learned of the Santa Clara battery, because one morning an old lady in black accompanied by a young man, evidently her son, visited a house which was to rent on the height in rear of the battery. The portrero was too lazy and sleepy to show them over the premises, but he granted them permission to investigate for themselves. They spent most of their time on the flat, parapeted roof of the house. At length they came down and said that the place did not suit them. The portrero went to sleep again. Johnny was never discouraged by the thought that his operations would be of small benefit to the admiral commanding the fleet in adjacent waters, and to the general commanding the army which was not going to attack Havana from the land side. At that time it was all the world's opinion that the army from Tampa would presently appear on the Cuban beach at some convenient point to the east or west of Havana. It turned out, of course, that the condition of the defenses of Havana was of not the slightest military importance to the United States, since the city was never attacked, either by land or sea. But Johnny could not foresee this. He continued to take his fancy risk, continued his majestic lie, with satisfaction, sometimes with delight, and with pride and in the psychologic distance was old Martha dancing with fear and shouting, Oh, Johnny, me son, what a born fool ye are! Sometimes she would address him thus, And when ye learn all this, how are ye going to get out with it? She was contemptuous. He would reply, as serious as a Cossack in his fatalism, Oh, I'll get out some way. His maneuvers in the vicinity of Reja and Juanabacoa were of a brilliant character. He haunted the sunny, long grass in the manner of a jackrabbit. Sometimes he slept under a palm, dreaming of the American advance, fighting its way along the military road to the foot of Spanish defenses. Even when awake he often dreamed it, and thought of the all-day crash and hot roar of an assault. Without consulting Washington, he had decided that Havana should be attacked from the southeast. An advance from the west would be contested right up to the bar of the Hotel Inglaterra. 
but when the first ridge of the southeast would be taken, the whole city with most of its defenses would lie under the American siege guns. And the approach to this position was as reasonable as any approach toward the muzzles of magazine rifles. Johnny viewed the grassy fields always as a prospective battleground, and one can see him lying there, filling the landscape with visions of slow-crawling black infantry columns, galloping batteries of artillery, streaks of faint blue smoke marking the modern firing lines, clouds of dust, a vision of ten thousand tragedies, and his ears heard the noises. But he was no idle shepherd boy, with a head haunted by sombre and glorious fancies. On the contrary, he was much occupied with practical matters. Some months after the close of the war, he asked me, "'Were you ever fired at from very near?' I explained some experiences which I had stupidly esteemed as having been rather near. "'But did you ever have him fire a volley on you from close, very close, say, thirty feet?' Highly scandalized, I answered, no, in that case, I would not be the crowning feature of the Smithsonian Institute. Well, he said, it's a funny effect. You feel as every hair on your head had been snatched out by the roots. Questioned further, he said, I walked right up on a Spanish outpost at daybreak once, and about twenty men let go at me. Thought I was a Cuban army, I suppose. What did you do? I run. Did they hit you at all? Nah. It had been arranged that some light ship of the squadron should rendezvous with him at a certain lonely spot on the coast on a certain day and hour, and pick him up. He was to wave something white. His shirt was not white, but he waved it whenever he could see the signal tops of a warship. It was a very tattered banner. After a ten-mile scramble through almost pathless thickets, he had very little on him which respectable men would call a shirt, and the less one says about his trousers, the better. This naked savage, then, walked all day up and down a small bit of beach waving a brown rag. At night he slept in the sand. At full daybreak he began to wave his rag. At noon he was waving his rag, at nightfall he donned his rag, and strove to think of it as a shirt. Thus passed two days, and nothing had happened. Then he retraced a twenty-five-mile way to the house of old Martha. At first she took him to be one of Havana's terrible beggars, and cried, "'And do you come here for alms? Look out that I do not beg of you!' The one unchanged thing was his laugh of pure mockery. When she heard it, she dragged him through the door. He paid no heed to her ejaculations, but went straight to where he had hidden some gold. As he was untying a bit of string from the neck of a small bag, he said, "'How is little Alfred?' "'Oh, recovered, thank heaven!' He handed Martha a piece of gold. "'Take this, and buy what you can on the corner. I'm hungry.' Martha departed with expedition. Upon her return she was beaming. She had foraged a thin chicken, a bunch of radishes, and two bottles of wine. Johnny had finished the radishes and one bottle of wine when the chicken was still a long way from the table. He called stoutly for more, and so Martha passed again into the street with another gold piece. She bought more radishes, more wine, and some cheese. They had a grand feast, with Johnny audibly wondering until a late hour why he had waved his rag in vain. There was no end to his suspense, no end to his work. He knew everything. He was an animate guide-book. After he knew a thing once, he verified it in several different ways in order to make sure. He fitted himself for a useful career like a young man in a college with the difference that the shadow of the garret fell ever upon his way, and that he was occasionally shot at, and that he could not get enough to eat, and that his existence was apparently forgotten, and that he contracted the fever. But one cannot think of the terms in which to describe a futility so vast, so colossal. 
he had builded a little boat, and the sea had receded and left him and his boat a thousand miles inland on the top of a mountain. The war fate had left Havana out of its plan, and thus isolated Johnny and his several pounds of useful information. The war fate left Havana to become the somewhat indignant victim of a peaceful occupation at the close of the conflict, and Johnny's data were worth as much as a carpenter's lien on the North Pole. He had suffered and labored for about as complete a bit of absolute nothing as one could invent. If the company which owned the sugar plantation had not generously continued his salary during the war, he would not have been able to pay his expenses on the amount allowed him by the government, which, by the way, was a more complete bit of absolute nothing than one could possibly invent. 4. I met Johnny in Havana in October 1898. If I remember rightly, the USS Resolute and the USS Scorpion were in the harbor, but beyond these two terrible engines of destruction there were not as yet any of the more stern signs of the American success. Many Americans were to be seen in the streets of Havana, where they were not in any way molested. Among them was Johnny, in white duck and a straw hat cool, complacent, and with eyes rather more steady than ever. I addressed him upon the subject of his supreme failure, but I could not perturb his philosophy. In reply he simply asked me to dinner. "'Come to the Café Aguacate at seven-thirty to-night,' he said. "'I haven't been there in a long time. We shall see if they cook as well as ever.' I turned up promptly, and found Johnny in a private room smoking a cigar in the presence of a waiter who was blue in the gills. "'I've ordered the dinner,' he said cheerfully. "'Now I want to see if you won't be surprised how well they can do here in Havana.' I was surprised. I was dumbfounded. Rarely in the history of the world have two rational men sat down to such a dinner. It must have taxed the ability and endurance of the entire working force of the establishment to provide it. The variety of dishes was, of course, related to the markets of Havana, but the abundance and general profligacy was related only to Johnny's imagination. Neither of us had an appetite. Our fancies fled in confusion before this puzzling luxury. I looked at Johnny as if he were a native of Tibet. I had thought him to be a most simple man, and here I found him reveling in food like a fat old senator of Rome's decadence. And if the dinner itself put me to open-eyed amazement, the names of the wines finished everything. Apparently Johnny had had but one standard, and that was the cost. If a wine had been very expensive, he had ordered it. I began to think him probably a maniac. At any rate, I was sure that we were both fools. Seeing my fixed stare, he spoke with affected languor. I wish Peacock's brains and melted pearls were to be had here in Havana. We'd have em. Then he grinned. As a mere skirmisher, I said, In New York we think we dine well. But really, this, you know, well, Havana? Johnny waved his hand pompously. Oh, I know. Directly after coffee, Johnny excused himself for a moment and left the room. When he returned, he said briskly, Well, are you ready to go? As soon as we were in a cab and safely out of hearing of the Café Aguacate, Johnny lay back and laughed long and joyously. But I was very serious. Look here, Johnny, I said to him solemnly, when you invite me to dine with you, don't you ever do that again. And I'll tell you one thing, when you dine with me, you will probably get the ordinary table d'hôte. I was an older man. Oh, that's all right, he cried, and then he too grew serious. Well, as far as I am concerned, as far as I am concerned, he said, the war is now over. End of section 14